Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Welcome to this week's Painting of the Week. And this is uh, another um, episode where we're out of Brighton, we're in a gallery. In this case, uh, we're at the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester, uh, on Cape Ann, in New England. Uh, I'm currently making my Edward Hopper film, and I've, that's given me reason to come to this fantastic museum. And I'm with, uh, right now, Martha Oakes, who is the chief curator here. And we're going to talk about uh, a painting that she's chosen for us to do as our painting of the week which is called Gloucester Humoresque. It was painted in 1923, which, as we'll discuss, is a a very appropriate date vis-à-vis Edward Hopper. And it was painted by an artist called William Myritz. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So, Martha, of the many treasures in this gallery, why have you chosen this one? Well... It's nice to meet you, and thank you for being here. Uh, (laughs) William Meyerowitz, for uh, many, many years, was a central figure in the uh, Gloucester Art Colony, and this particular painting is of real historic importance. So it's a piece that's always out on display. It's a piece that has a lot to say about the history of art on Cape Ann in the 20th century, and it's one that sort of intrigues visitors also. So it's uh, one of my favorites for those reasons. So one of the things that you, you get a sense of with the Edward Hopper story is how they are drawn, artists like him are drawn to, I don't know if you would call this, uh, if if Gloucester is considered an art colony, but certainly in the summer you have this idea of artists, the sense of artists coming out of New York, in his case, and maybe, as in maybe two or three decades earlier, people were going up to Florence Griswold, for example, or other places. In this case, there's something about Gloucester that was drawing artists, and in this painting which, as you all should know now, uh, dear listener, if you go to seventh-art.com, you can see the painting, have a good look. It's basically full of artists painting Gloucester. So what was the appeal of Gloucester? And I think it's perfectly fair to say Gloucester was an art colony, especially during the early 20th century. It started out very slowly after the American Civil War, but then by 1910, and then right after the First World War, it was a very fashionable art colony that drew people from New York, Philadelphia, artists in particular, patrons from all over the place. Um, And that's what we see in the William Meyerwitz painting, Um, uh, the artists of Gloucester swarming all over East Gloucester with the harbor in the background. Um, And so it really is like a snapshot of 1923 and a, a testament to how popular the art colony had become by that time. But, but, but why Gloucester? close to Boston. It was accessible by steamship, by railroad. By the 1920s, you could drive here. It was a slow drive out from Boston, but so certainly accessible, more so than, say, going to Maine, something like that. Um, and also, early on, a number of influential teachers, art teachers, were here, and so, of course, their students followed them. The, the, the sculptor Charles Grafley was here early, and as a result, a whole stream of soon-to-be well-known American sculptors followed him. Um, art teachers like William Morris Hunt was here early. Um, John Twachman was here early. So that influenced and, and contributed to the stream of artists coming by the 20th century. We made a film uh, two, three years ago called The Artist's Garden. And I learned a lot about the American Impressionists, Charles Hassam, Twachman that you mentioned, and plenty of others. When you travel internationally, do you think that non-Americans, or even indeed Americans, don't actually know enough about the extensive nature of American art and artists at the beginning of the 20th century? Because the more I learn, the more, the more names are thrown up, the more art colonies there are. Um, you know, it's very easy to focus on New York or New York and Boston, but it seems to be extraordinarily extensive and nationwide. 
And I think if you think today how awful Philadelphia and New York can be in the summertime and think of it in a time before air conditioning. And so just like today, people who could get away wanted to get away. And again, Cape Ann was close enough that um, it could be a short visit or extend you know, for a couple of months. But um, I think people recognize the names associated with the Cape Ann Art Colony, Hassam, Twachman, Sloan, Hopper, but they don't always realize that they congregated here as well as in other art colonies. Now, around about this time, um, art is in the United States is beginning its you know, journey to abstraction. Mm-hmm. If you were walking past these artists sketching and painting in the streets of Gloucester and on the beach of Gloucester, what would we be seeing? Would we be seeing impressionism? Would we be seeing abstraction? realism what what what's on their canvases and in their sketchbooks i think you would have been seeing a little bit of everything and that's what's so wonderful about the william meyerwitz painting because in that painting he depicts sort of the range of artwork that was be, being created here by 1923 and um in the painting he has um, shown two organizations that were established in 1922 and opened their doors in 1923 that embodied a, a larger debate that was taking place across the country as to whether art shows should be juried or non-juried, what kind of art should be shown, what kind of art should not be shown. And Meyerowitz was aware that this was going on. And so in his Gloucester Humoresque, he has on the right-hand side the North Shore Arts Association, which represented the conservative traditional outlook here on Cape Ann and operated with a jury system. And then on the left-hand side of the composition, you see the Gloucester Society of Artists, which was the opposing organization that was more interested in progressive forms of art. Um, And one of the best um, most recognized artist to exhibit there in the 1920s was Stuart Davis, who even by that time was moving um, away from sort of traditional painting to his more abstract work. So Meyerowitz was very aware that there was a whole range of artwork being created here and that he felt strongly like Bellows and Henry that people should be allowed to see whatever they wanted. So therefore the non-juried show. But that's the sort of the gist of Gloucester Humoresque. He has captured both opposing sides of that debate about what art was in 1923 in a wonderful composition set against busy Gloucester Harbour. Tell me about a little bit more about him. I mean, how is he a young artist? Is he an established artist? Is he a tutor, a student? What, what is his biography? Well, he was born, believe it or not, in Ukraine in 1887 and uh, was from a Jewish family. And so like many Jewish families, they fled for one reason or another. And he was brought to the United States in the early 20th century by his father. I think his, the rest of the family joined them later. Um, they landed in New York. Um, from all accounts, William Meyerowitz, his passions were music and art and his father encouraged that. Um, so he went to art school in New York. Um, And then in 1917, he um, is involved in something called the People's Art Guild, which is Robert Henry and George Bellows' organization meant to bring art to people, so to get art out of the fancy galleries and into neighborhood settlement houses or neighborhood galleries. And Meyerowitz gets involved in that, and he meets a young artist named Teresa Bernstein, who is from Philadelphia. She was also involved in the People's Art Guild. And the two of them fall in love. They marry in 1919, and then they sort of follow this wave of New York artists coming to Gloucester. Um, John Sloan had already been here, Twachman, Hassam, um, and the uh, Meyerowitz and Bernstein arrive um, shortly after their marriage. They are first in the Lanesville section of Gloucester, which is on the back of the Cape. And then in the early 1920s, they buy a house in East Gloucester right near where the North Shore Art Association and the Gloucester Society of Artists would be organized. And for the rest of their lives, Meyerowitz and Bernstein divided their time between New York City and here. They really were permanent summer residents. Many people like John Sloan and Twachman would rent here, come and go, just a limited number of summers. But Meyerowitz and his wife were here through the rest of the 20th century, so they really became figureheads of the Gloucester Art Colony. And 
the painting has a you know a, a prominent place in 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 this fabulous museum, Cape Ann Museum. What is the history of the museum, and how did the painting end up here? Well, the his the museum has been here for a long time since the ni- since actually since nineteen twenty three twenty four. That's when we moved into this facility. Um, for many many years, our focus was on the artist Fitzhenry Lane for a very good reason. And um, it wasn't until the 1970s and 80s that we really began to focus on the 20th century art community here in Gloucester. And um, that painting was given to us by an art professor from Wellesley College named James O'Gorman, who still lives up in Maine and is still working in the field of American art. And he sort of challenged the staff at that time to realize that there was more than Fitzhenry Lane. The story went on and he was friends with William Meyerowitz and Teresa Bernstein and he said look at this great painting. This is like the history of the 20th century art community here on Cape Ann. And with Jim's help our collection has grown. We've filled in gaps that were missing. Um, We have several works by Meyerowitz and Bernstein um, and are working on all the other artists who uh, made their way through here. I um, on another podcast I talked with uh, Chris McCarthy at um, the province of Pam Provincetown mm-hmm. Art Academy Museum. Academy and Museum yeah. and what I was asking you about the the commercial demand for artists you know what was the commercial context in which they were working and one of the things she mentioned was how you know, men could sell their paintings seven days a week, but women could sell them for one day a week, which is dreadful, obviously. Um, you mentioned Teresa and marrying William. What was it in 1923? How were how are things different for the female artists that were working here and wanted to become artists, as opposed to the male artists? Well, we're probably much the same as Provincetown was. Um, When you look at Gloucester Humoresque, you see women artists there. You also see women patrons. Um, There was a strong group of patrons here, um, and so men and women could sell their artwork. Teresa Bernstein is a wonderful example of an early American woman artist who was successful. I said before she was from Philadelphia, and she was part of a group called the Philadelphia Ten, who were the first women artists to exhibit together um, during... 19 teens, so a time when it wasn't the thing to do. Um, And she was adamant that she would be an artist, she would support herself and William, she would sign her paintings T. Bernstein, and I think she's the one who recommended to Joe Nivison that she consider, you know, just using a J or something, but uh, Teresa Bernstein was uh, quite successful throughout her life. And um, when we look through the records, of the Russia Art Association and the Gloucester Society of Artists. There are many women involved, so I don't know if we were just slightly ahead of Provincetown, but um, I'm not saying it was easy for women artists, but you do see their names an awful lot um, in early exhibition records from the beginning of the 20th century. There's a very nice book in the in the bookshop, Capan Artists. I should point out, by the way, that um, Capan is uh, uh, part of the coastline here and contains correct me if I'm wrong, four significant towns, would that be the right? And Gloucester is the largest of the four. Um, uh, Is there such a thing as the Cape Ann School, I mean, or uh, the Gloucester School of Art? There is a a school called the Cape Ann School of Art, and it mostly refers to early to mid 20th century landscape painters in a very, who worked in a very traditional mode. So Stuart Davis would not fit into that, that mode. People like Emil Gruppi, who might be a name people recognize, Al, Aldro Hibbard, um, but very traditional uh, landscape painters, and they are referred to as the Cape Ann School. People like um, William Meyerowitz, Stuart Davis, Edward Hopper, they don't really fit into that school of painting. Um, so that's just a term that's come to be, have a local significance, I think. Now, one of the things that we that I learnt um, about Gloucester is that the houses, by and large, that Edward Hopper paints are, or so I was told, they're owned, owned by ship captains. Um, but these are nice houses. So, um, are these the type of people that are buying artworks 
you know, to understand the Dutch Golden Age, you, obviously you understand that there's an awful lot of money coming into Amsterdam and people are building nice houses and they want artworks on their walls. Mm -hmm. What is the market for these 1923 artists? Who's buying their artworks, if anyone? So by 1923, Gloucester is still very much a working community with a very active fishing industry. Um, and all the businesses that, that supported the fishing industry. So shipbuilding, sail making, all of the stuff that went into supporting the fishing industry. And those were very much working class people. But by the 19 teens, there's also a very energetic summer colony here of just tourists and summer folks, not artists necessarily, people from the same places, from New York and Washington, Philadelphia, who have luxurious summer homes and they're cropping up in the 1920s all across KBM. We have a wonderful architectural plan collection here that's in the 1920s. You look at the houses, they're like what were being built, um, not as quite like Newport, but along the coast of Maine, beautiful shingle styled houses. And I'm sure that they, those people collected art by some of these artists, whether the ordinary working class people, fishermen and related uh, workers collected much art? I'm not sure. Every now and then, even today, we're surprised a family will show up that's just an ordinary working family going back generations after generations and they have a, a painting by somebody. It doesn't usually turn out to be Edward Hopper or um, or John Sloan. It, you know, it's usually someone from that Cape Ann school that has more local connections. Um, but it was, it, it was a very diverse community by 1920, not just fishermen and not just wealthy people, not just artists. Is there any suggestion that any of the artists in this particular painting is Edward Hopper? I've not heard that. So Teresa Bernstein, she lived to be 101 or 102, and she loved to talk about that painting. She is in that painting. William Meyerwitz himself is in that painting. Stuart Davis is in that painting, but she never said anything about Hopper being there, and I can't pick him out. I can't pick out a tall, bald man <laughs> who looks like him. Which, which, which ones, can you point out where she is and where William... So William Meyerwitz is on the right-hand side. He's standing right in front of their summer house. It's the white clapboard house, and he's standing right in front of it working on a painting. Teresa is on the left, seated under a tree with her paint box in her lap and her easel right nearby. And then their friend, Stuart Davis, is right in the center of the painting. He's got on, look like sort of 1920s golfer's pants, this white the sort of stop below his knee. And he is also standing at his easel. And those are the three artists that I'm sure of. There's a, there's a small thing that I kind of uh, empathize with, with Edward Hopper. Um, because I'm a little bit the same. I, I once did a photographic weekend where there were eight or nine of us photographers and we we're taken out to a beautiful site, maybe in the lee of a castle, and we we're asked, using a specific technique, to you know, take, get, get a really nice picture. And all the rest of the group will look at the castle, and I do a 180 degrees and have the castle to my back and look, see what's in the other direction. <laughs> And I, I kind of know that Hopper was a little bit the same. You know, he might be out sketching and everyone else is sketching a church and he'll turn around and sketch the building. Now, in this painting, these artists are kind of here, there and everywhere, seemingly sketching whatever is in front of them. Is it... Two questions, really. One is, do you think that, you know, Edward Hopper, when he went out and he's sketching one of the buildings, that he would have passed... You know, he really would have passed other artists. It was so busy with artists that he would have passed other artists sketching, mm -hmm. number one. And number two, is he unusual? I, haven't, I don't know the other artists well enough to know whether other other artists painting the fronts of buildings, you know, famously light on the side of a building, or is he rather unique that in Gloucester, I mean, these buildings are lovely, but is everyone else sketching and painting the church, the beach, the schooners not everyone and it's interesting you should bring it up this week because coming up for auction at bonhams shortly are some drawings done by Stuart davis probably 1915 1920 and he's downtown in gloucester he's sketching the front of of houses on a random street just houses that caught his eye so while a lot of people gravit artists gravitated to the beach 
because the beaches were getting full by the 1920s. There still were others like Hopper who were interested by the other face of the city. And in terms of your first question, um, I'm sure Hopper would have passed by artists working. Um, I think Meyerowitz's painting is a pretty good representation of how busy it was in East Gloucester in particular. Um, we also know from some of Hopper's sketches done in and around the street where the Meyerowitzes lived and where other artists lived, that Hopper was in that neighborhood. He was prowling around. He was doing drawings right across the street from a New York couple named Charles Allen and Alice Beach Winter, who he would have known from New York. So he was in the area. He was, he was not on his own as he sort of explored the city. Fabulous. Well, Martha, thank you very much. I'm now going to go and have a good old look around your museum again, because there's so much here, not least the models of the, the, mm. the harbour. That's a fantastic model. Yes. Um, and uh, th- actually, just to finish off, obviously when you come in, on, on the left-hand side is the original museum. Uh, that's a wonderful place to walk through. Could you just very quickly tell people what that is because if that doesn't get people coming here I don't know what what will (laughs) so the very front of our building is the very oldest part of the museum it's a a house built in 1804 for a Gloucester sea captain and it became the first permanent headquarters of this museum in 1923 when we purchased the building and by 1926 it's open furnished as it would have looked during the sea captain's time and from that little old house over the years we have just expanded it's almost once a generation we've run out of exhibit space and so we've add on galleries and so it's been a remarkable evolution Um, but that little house in the front is where where we all started super thank you very much thank you for listening to the painting of the week podcast for more information please visit our website at 7th-art.com or contact us by emailing info at 7th-art.com See you next time. Hi. I hope you enjoyed that episode of uh, Painting of the Week. Um, This is uh, Season 3 of uh, the podcast so i would uh, thoroughly advise recommend like uh if you would go to have a listen at season one and season two because there's another 20 in each obviously don't listen to them all you'll be absolutely sick to death of uh, laura and i but um there's some absolutely beautiful paintings that we talk about uh which are worth looking at either as you know, via the seventh-art.com website, or you can actually also watch them on YouTube where you can hear the podcast and see the painting. Um, So, enjoy.